Brad, obviously one of the most key essential parts of the quail equation is nesting, nest success, that kind of thing. Uh, nationwide, I know the average nest success for Bob White's only about 30%. We do quite a bit better out here. And I'd like for you to talk about where do quail nest, what kind of situations do we look for, and then uh, talk a little bit about how do we manage for better nesting cover. So, so you know, a, a person like me, a quail hunter, could go through life and maybe flush two or three quail off the nest in their lifetime. How many are you studying right now? Uh, right now, this summer, we've had about 35 nests, but over the last four years, we've had hundreds. Well, now, how do you find those? Using radio telemetry, uh, the, the bird's going to be sitting on nest nearly all day, only coming off um, maybe once in the morning or evening to feed. So uh, I, I can go in and just check on her. If she's in the same spot, I know she's on nest. If she moves off, I can look at how many eggs she's incubating or whether she's hatched out or been depredated or what's going on. Now Brad's been with us, this is his fourth year. He interned for, for three years, now he's a graduate student, so he'll be here for another year. And he's, he's become my nest specialist. Whenever one of the summer interns think they have a bird that's nesting, in other words, it's been in the same location for three times, they turn it over to Brad. And Brad does the fine scale, let's get in there and find the bird without disturbing the bird. So Brad, uh, from what you've seen out here in, in Fisher County at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch, what is a typical nest site? And, and also, what's the diversity of nest sites that you've found? A typical nest site for bobwhite and scaled quail is usually at the base of a bunch grass and uh, using residual growth or the old, grow last, old growth from last year. Um, it's usually about a, as big as a basketball at, at the base. And some of those examples of the species that we have here that those bunch grasses might be purple threon, klein grass, silver blue stem, uh, tobosa, or even Texas winter grass. So uh, we actually have a demonstration of a nest here that's in some silver blue stem that um, we'll be looking at, at the composition, the structure, and, and what a nest actually looks like of a bobwhite. Well, we must be standing within a yard of it, but I don't see it, so they do a pretty good job of hiding their nest, don't they? Yeah, uh, a nest has to be concealed very well um, so that the hen can survive. And uh, it's actually right at your foot right there. And um, you would probably never see it, and half the time whenever I check my, uh, my nests, when the bird is off nest, I have to look pretty good to actually find the nest. The hen will conceal those eggs, building a roof-like structure from that residual grass over the eggs. So even when you're right on top of it, you almost have to be at an angle to see the white of the eggs. Well, the fact, Brad, that again, I'm standing within a foot of that nest bowl and I couldn't find it, uh, is a testament to, again, what the Bob White is searching for and, and, and also speaks to the, the fact that we got to have a lot of nesting cover uh, because if we just have one clump of nesting cover that meets their criteria, uh, that's probably not a good thing, is it? No. Uh, if I were to give some sort of management uh, practical kind of advice to a landowner, I'd say you want to manage for abundance and composition. You want a lot of nesting cover and you want the right type of nesting cover. Just just one clump of uh, a good nesting cover probably won't suffice. As Val Lehman once said, he was an esteemed quail biologist in South Texas, basically choosing the best house in the neighborhood it doesn't always provide the greatest security. Rather they found that when that nest can blend in around the surroundings as you can see around here, a lot of the bunch grass um, clumps look similar and that's probably why this, um, one of the reasons why this uh, nest survived. And you got to keep in mind, again, that, that we've got a lot of things looking for our nest. We've got coyotes, skunks, raccoons, snakes. So we've got a whole long list of predators that would love to find our nest. And so we have to work on the premise of what they call thimble rigging, the old idea of the shell game at the carnival. We've got to provide a lot of shells out there for that quail to put her pea under, her nest under. And then by diffusion, we, we diffuse that predator search efficiency. Based on our work and some other work in Texas, we think 250 to 300 potential nest sites per acre, per acre. So that's about 250 over the size of a, of a football field or about 25 within the infield of a softball diamond. And that's the kind of density we need to be able to, again, to diffuse our enemy's search efficiency. One of the nest sites that uh, we found quail use quite often is one that's a pariah to a lot of ranchers and, and bird dog people, and that's prickly pear. We have a lot of prickly pear here at Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. Typically, we think it's an asset, at least for nesting and within moderation. The prickly pear, as you can appreciate, 
provides some kind of mechanical protection. Those spines do give it a little bit of protection against some of its enemies. So Brad, we found a nest. You found a nest this morning or a depredated nest, one that's been broken into. So it's not foolproof by any means, but describe what you got here in terms of nesting and, and uh, what you've learned from this one. So what I found here was a, a nest in prickly pear that's right on the bas back side of this prickly pear pad here. There's not a whole bunch of grass cover covering the nest bowl. There's just some of this old field ragweed. It wasn't concealed very well. A lot of times, even when uh, a bird does choose prickly pear as its main nest substrate, it's usually in conjunction with grass. In the rolling plains, that grass is usually associated, um, the grass that's usually associated with prickly pear is Texas winter grass. And um, they can use that to conceal their nest with that prickly pear as a mechanical defense. So again, uh, prickly pear, you mentioned Texas winter grass, silver blue stem. You know, when you read the literature about Bob White quail, typically the premier nest site is little blue stem. But uh, it, it's a misnomer to think you gotta have little blue stem to have good nesting cover. So again, just summarize, again, the variety of, of nests that you found and what an ideal nest nesting landscape should look like? Well, the birds just have to play the cards they're dealt pretty much. And we don't have much little blue stem out here, um, but when they can find structure that's similar to that, that has that, that big base, that um, residual grass um, growth um, the next year, you know, that, that's, that's key. So some of those examples would be Klein grass, Tobosa, silver blue stem, purple threon, and uh, Arizona cotton top. Some of the things that we have common out here Brad, as, as, as I travel across western Oklahoma, western Texas, uh, various parts of quail range, I kind of get a jaundiced eye sometimes about grazing and overgrazing because in many cases, if not most, where we've got a weak link in our chain, it's nesting cover. So if you're interested in improving or enhancing your nesting cover, what would be some things that a manager could do? I think timely grazing and proper grazing intensities or stocking rates are key. Um, however, also maybe uh, providing some prickly pear and some woodier substrates that quail will nest in, such as um, prickly pear and yucca, um, could be beneficial during the drought of years. They're kind of your drought insurance. When you don't have a good grass crop and you're, you're trying to graze and, and run cattle at the same time, you kind of have to have some sort of alternative. And prickly pear is one of those good alternatives. Okay. Brad, we, we've talked about how the national average across the range of Bob White, the average nest success is about 30%. That's pretty poor. We've been able to boast some pretty high numbers out here, some 60% plus kind of numbers. Why? What do, what do we offer that the national average doesn't have? I believe availability and good habitat. So uh, I believe if, if every place across the United States looked like this, that, that average would be a lot higher.